good afternoon. I'm Kevin Clements, the director of the Toda Peace Institute, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the first public conversation in our thematic series on climate change and conflict in Oceania. We're very privileged that the Minister for Justice, Communications and Foreign Affairs of Tuvalu, the Honorable Simon Coffey, is able to participate in this inaugural conversation. Before he entered Parliament in 2018, Simon had a very distinguished career as a lawyer and magistrate in Tuvalu. His master's degree from the University of Malta was on maritime law, and since, since becoming foreign minister in 2019, he's been at the forefront of Tuvalu's cutting edge policies on climate change, conflict, new concepts of sovereignty, and the protection of maritime resources. He made a spectacular contribution to the last COP meeting by delivering his address from a lectern in the sea off the Tudalu coast, standing knee deep in water in his suit. This was to illustrate how climate change and sea level rise is already affecting Tuvalu and behavior. Uh, this uh, particular contribution to the COP uh, conference uh, generated global publicity and certainly put Simon Coffey and Tuvalu on the world map. Simon Coffey, welcome to this inaugural conversation. We're joined in it by Dr. Volker Berge, who's the responsible for TOTA's thematic program on climate change and conflict in Oceania. Volker has had a stellar career as an expert on politics and conflict in Melanesia, particularly with reference to Bougainville, and he's focused on ways in which people living in Oceania can harness local resources, culture and tradition to mitigate and ameliorate the worst effects of climate change. So welcome Volker and over to you for the first question. We think of Tuvalu really as being at the forefront of the discussions on the challenges of climate change worldwide, but also particularly in, in the Pacific. And so we um, were very interested in uh, this Future Now project that you launched a couple of months ago. And what really surprised us with this Future Now project is uh, that you put Tuvalu and cultural values uh, front and center in, in this project, which is pretty unusual for governments to focus so much on cultural values um, and to pursue a value and culture-based approach to diplomacy. So can you explain for a start of this interview why you did this and how you think these cultural values are important for dealing with the challenges of climate change? Mm -hmm. Sure, um, thank you, Volker. Thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to, to speak on the Future Now project. Um, as, as you would have noted, the, our culture and Tuvalan values is a big part of, uh, of the Future Now project, and it's, it's also uh, reflected in our, our foreign policy. Um, just to give you a bit of a context, Tuvalu is a community-based uh, society. Um, in that, I mean, we are a very close-knitted community. Uh, we value relationships. We value the, the communal order. And we value also our responsibilities as individuals to, to maintaining the, the peace and harmony amongst our, our community. Uh, and one example is, you know, the, the, even our systems uh, in, in the islands, uh, for example, our land tenure system, uh, we focus very much on the collective uh, ownership collective responsibility over our, our, our land and our, and, our, and our oceans. And uh, the question then is, what relevance is this to the, to the international uh, community? Um, my, my, my view and the view of the government is that the, the world has become um, so interconnected that we've become a single community. Uh, and we see examples of this, you know, with the, the impacts of COVID-19, uh, the impact of the, the war in Ukraine and wars in different parts of the world on the, the, the global economy. So we've, I think we've reached a stage uh, in our world today that um, we've become so vulnerable to each other's actions uh, and you cannot take things in isolation. Uh, and climate change is, is a perfect example of that, um, that we, we share the same environment regardless of which part of the world you live in. Uh, we share in the, in the same environment. And so we feel that because of the, the context that we've arrived at now, that it is important that we re-look at some of these values and see the importance of working collectively as a, as a community of nations, as opposed to continually pushing and driving for our own national uh, interest. And so that's where we see the, the sort of the, the relevance of, of these values. 
Uh, yeah, we say it's cultural, but I, I, I think that, that the values themselves are, are universal. Um, some of these values are respect, consensus building, uh, collaboration, cooperation. Uh, these, these are values that are very common in, in a community-based society in the Pacific. Uh, so we feel that these values are very important to, to the current emerging global context uh, that, that we've arrived at uh, at this time. Thank you. And can you maybe elaborate a bit on this concept of Fale Pili that's in, in, your, in your document? Because I find this really fascinating and how this Fale Pili translates from community life in Tuvalu to the Pacific and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Fale Pili, uh, the, the translation of the, of, of the word Fale Pili is it's basically like a neighborhood and you're living in close proximity to your uh, to your neighbors and the the concept um, you know it, it, it entails that um, or it implies that if you're you're living in close proximity to one another that you you take responsibility for your neighbor and you look out for you for your neighbor uh, in fact in the context of Tuvalu you 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 have children uh, you, you're basically responsible as well for looking after your the, the, your neighbor's children that, that could be uh, entering your house so we, we have this, this sense of uh, community and responsibility to, to your neighbor. Um, I guess, you know, as, as the Bible says, be, be a good neighbor, do to others as you would do to, to, unto yourself. Uh, and so we feel that uh, that principle becomes very, very relevant on the, on the international plane, especially on issues like climate change, um, you know, where, where you can't just pursue your, your immediate economic uh, interests without considering your neighbor, without considering the well-being of the, the global community. And that's, that's fascinating. And I think this is something that the international community should, should actually take on board this concept. Another issue that uh, st uh, struck us when we read uh, this um, Future Now project document is that at first sight, it looks like there's a contradiction in there because you say, on the one hand, Tuvalu stands against relocation as a solution to the climate crisis. And you say the same thing in the Tuvalu foreign policy document of 2020. But on the other hand, you put a lot of thinking into what happens if people from Tuvalu have to move, have to uh, migrate or, or uh, relocate. And so mm -hmm. is there a contradiction here? Because you say, no, uh, this is not a solution. We want to stay where we are and we have a right, right to stay where we are. And on the other hand, you do all this planning for uh, future, the future possibility or need to relocate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for pointing that out. And we've, we've been quite... Um... Uh, you know, we're aware of, of how this could be uh, interpreted or misinterpreted by the, the global community. Uh, but, but our view is that, um, you know, we don't want uh, countries or the, the big countries, the big emitters to use relocation as, as, a, as, a, as a solution that will solve the, the climate crisis that we are facing right now. Uh, in fact, the, the, the primary strategy is to, for countries to cut down on the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I think that is the primary strategy, and, and also we want to be able to build up our islands, build um, our, our sea walls to be able to, to protect our islands. But we also recognize that uh, many of these things we're not in control of. Uh, we're not in control of the decisions by the bigger countries, whether they, they, you know, they're willing to, to cut down the greenhouse gas emissions or not. And so we feel responsible as a government to, to be able to prepare for, for both scenarios. Um, a worst case scenario where countries just don't come together and, and, and take the necessary cuts to, to be able to mitigate the, the impacts of climate change. And that's where the, the worst case scenario, that's where the, the Future Now uh, project comes in. It's, it's looking to a future and, and what can we do now to, to prepare for, for that, that kind of scenario. Obviously, we don't want to reach that, that stage, but I think as a responsible government, you have to have a plan for, uh, for every scenario that, we, that the country could face in the, in the, in the future. And so that's, that's how we try to balance this. We want to be clear that uh, we don't want it to be a, a primary solution, but uh, you know, the, the, the reality is, and, and given where we are right now with the trajectory that we're on right now, Tuvalu could be gone in a in hundred years uh, from now. So we, we need to have a plan in place. 
Thank you very much. I, I think this uh, clarifies clarifies the point uh, very well. Uh, you mentioned uh, sea walls and things like that. So, so what are the options for a country like Tuvalu for in situ adaptation, like building sea walls or planting mangroves or raising houses and infrastructure? Uh, you might know that the latest IPCC report on vulnerabilities and adaptation also focuses on these measures that could be done in small islands in situ, like planting mangroves and so forth. Is something like this happening in Tuvalu? And what options for uh, this are there? Or is it just technically not, not feasible or too expensive or whatever? Yeah, I, I think to the, the solution to, to, to save our, our lands is to you know, to, to, to build seawalls, to um, conduct, uh, have reclamation, reclaim land um, in our lagoons. I, th I think that's the, the solution that we're after. But as you would understand, that's uh, very expensive to, to be able to do uh, those projects. And the, the experience has been, um, you know, it's been very difficult to, to get access to, to climate finance, to be able to, to conduct some of these, these major projects. And so that's the, the challenge that we we're in at the moment. Um, you know, we, we hear a lot of countries coming up with pledges, but I mean, the, the implementation is, is a different story. And so uh, it's important that we continue to, to push for, for these issues because countries that are most affected by climate change are, are contributing the least to the problem. So I think the, the bigger emitters need to take greater responsibility uh, to be able to provide for the, the effects of their, their actions. Mm. And this is where also loss and damage comes into play. Huh? And as I, uh, as I understand it, Pacific Island countries uh, pushed very hard in Glasgow for loss and damage uh, issues to, to get more prominence, and you were not that successful in, in that regard. Yeah, yeah, we were not successful in, in that regard. We were looking to establish a um, financial mechanism under uh, the, uh, the outcome of COP, uh, but unfortunately that, that didn't go through. Although there's text there that reflects that there'll be ongoing discussions and to explore uh, those options. So uh, that's something we will need to, to pursue. Mm. And um, what you, you mentioned, the, the close-knit communities in a society like Tuvalu, and as I understand it, this also means a close connection to land and to the sea, which also, of course, uh, then poses challenges for this idea of relocation. So what do you think, how can you, in a culturally sensitive way uh, discuss these issues and plan for relocation and what uh, who who are the stakeholders who should come into this debate uh, for instance um, i'm thinking of of the churches uh, that play a very important role in civil society in all the pacific island countries so this connection you you have this this i think in tuvalu it's fenua and in fiji and it's uh, Vanua, so this this people land connection, and what does this close connection tell you about uh, how to go about the the relocation issue? Yeah, yeah the, the the relocation issue is a is a difficult one for um, for the people of Tuvalu to to even consider. Uh, as you said, given the the connection, the close connection they have with the with the land. And, and ancestors that are buried in the, the, the lands as well. So it's a very difficult issue. In fact, if, if you ask many Tuvaluans, they'd, they'd, be, they'd rather stay back and, and face the, you know, the dire effects of, of climate change than, than, than moving elsewhere. So it, it is a, a challenging issue and it's something that, um, you know, that, that needs to be considered at all levels. Uh, but we feel that uh, working with our traditional leaders um, is, is, is an important approach. Traditional leaders are very influential in community life. Um, so we, we, we certainly want to engage all stakeholders when, when um, exploring the, the option of, of, of relocation. And is there already relocation going on within Tuvalu from the outer islands to uh, Funafuti to the capital city? And is this already climate change induced? So what, what are the dynamics within Tuvalu at the moment? Yeah, at the moment, 
there's, there's about 60% of our population uh, live on the capital, Frankfurti. Um, so obviously there's, a, there's an, um, an urban drift um, and traction to come to the, to the capital. Uh, but with with the you know we've had experiences with with strong cyclones hitting the the islands and we've had to um, you know relocate uh, people uh, to different areas because of of natural disasters. Uh, so that's that's something that's uh, I mean we, we were having a little experience with that at, at, at the moment. Mm. But uh, with the COVID situation, I also heard that people went back to uh, rural areas or outer islands from Funafuti uh, once COVID uh, uh, or the danger of COVID struck. Have these people left Funafuti for good back to the outer islands or, islands, or have they come back in the meantime? Yeah, initially when we, um, we declared a state of emergency because of the, um, the COVID-19 and the border closure, Uh, we, the government encouraged people to to return to their their home islands, um, uh, just as a as a measure for for, for safety. Uh, that was two years ago, but I think over the the year we've we've had people slowly coming back as well to the um, uh, to the to the capital. I'd like to ask a rather delicate question, and we'll follow up on this later. But it has to do with the statehood of Tuvalu. As you know, the Montevideo Convention says to be a state, one, you have to have a permanent population, two, a defined territory, and three, a government and the capacity to enter into relations with other states. So what happens if Tuvalu loses its territory or your people have to leave the territory of the state of Tuvalu? Can Tuvalu still exist as a state then and maintain its sovereignty? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's uh, obviously a legal issue that uh that we 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 um exploring different avenues to be able to uh uh i guess recognize the proposition that a state can exist without a, a physical territory a land territory um I, i i i acknowledge the the montevideo convention that sets out the the criteria uh for a state but i would i would argue that um from state practice uh that criteria is not necessarily um followed in fact, uh, you know, we have examples during the, the World War II when the Ger Germans uh, occupied certain countries in the, in the West that the, ally, the Allies continued to recognize uh, those countries or those, the governments of those countries that uh, were in exile. So the concept of government in exile is something that's also um, recognized uh, under international law. So I would argue that it comes down to, to recognition and how states recognize each other. Um, and that's that we're approaching this issue of, of statehood, um, that if we get countries to recognize this, this proposition, then, then we feel that this could contribute towards the, the, the formation of, of customary international law or recognize customary um, norms. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's a completely new area because we've never had a situation in the past where a country disappears because, because of climate change. Uh, but we feel that we want to to pioneer on this on this stage, and I think there are many countries that that share the same concerns as Tuvalu uh, that would certainly come on board with this. And the the approach that we've taken is that we've uh, insisted that countries that want to establish ties with Tuvalu uh, that they recognize this um, these principles. And so we've we've included it in our joint communiques when we're establishing uh, ties with new countries or reaffirming our our relationship with with other states. And so we've done that with two countries so far, uh, with Venezuela and St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, earlier this week, I signed off the joint communique with, with the, the ambassador, the, sorry, the high commissioner in, in, in London. Uh, so that's the, the angle that we're approaching this. And we feel that the more countries that come on board with this, then we are contributing to the, to the formation of, of customary international law. So... Um... This means that every country, every other state that now wants to establish relationships with Tuvalu or wants to maintain relationships with Tuvalu has to agree uh, to this, this position. Otherwise, you would cut ties with them. Or what does this mean? Well, we're saying we're insisting. We're insisting that, we, that they recognize uh, these. Um, certainly, we would make it a condition for new countries. But we are approaching again our... our our partners at the moment, our countries that we have ties with to, to sign off on reaffirmation uh, joint communiques. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the position that we've, we've taken. 
The problem that I'm seeing here is that there are historical experiences for governments in exile. And you mentioned the Second World War and the Polish government or the French government sitting in London. But so far, we don't have any experience of a nation in exile. So how would you go about this? Would you ask other countries to provide some territory for the Tuvaluan government in exile, thereby making it possible to stay a Tuvaluan citizen, even if the whole population had to relocate? It's difficult for us to imagine how this could work. Can you elaborate on this a bit and what you think um, is realistic? Yeah, and, it, it, and it's, it's impossible to also get an example from our history uh, because we've never had a country disappear, uh, you know, lose its physical territory because of climate change. So I, I acknowledge that it is a, um, it's a completely new area and, and many of the, you know, conventions like the UNCLOS was developed at the time where climate change was not even an, on the agenda. Um, so we, we, we understand that it's a completely new area and it's something that we're pioneering. That's, that's, that's the point of all this is that we, we need to start somewhere and, and pioneer this. And I think the more countries that, uh, that recognize it, then, then we, I think we, we're moving towards achieving our goal of getting that recognition um, as, as, as a state. Obviously, we, you know, you, you would have to relocate, you would have to relocate to somewhere physically. Um, uh, but we, you know, we, we've received offers from Fiji, for example, um, for, for relocation. Um, but I think the, the key here is, is for us to be able to maintain that identity under international law, to, to have the voting rights, to, to have uh, capacity to enter into arrangements with, with countries. Uh, and more importantly, to, to have continue our claim to our maritime zones um, that contains, uh, uh, you know, resources in, in, in our waters. Uh, so that's, that's the, the approach that we've, uh, we've taken on that. Yeah, let's uh, talk about the maritime zones in a minute. Uh, but before we go there, you also talk about um, Tuvalu to become a digital nation with a digital uh, government. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because that's fascinating and also totally new territory. So again, Tuvalu is at the forefront of uh, ways of thinking about these issues. So what, what mm. is a digital nation and a digital, digital government? Right. So, um, yeah, so we, we, we imagine that in the future, um, worst case scenario, we've, we've, we've moved out of our, our lands. Uh, we would still need to, to operate effectively as a government. Uh, we would still need that, that coordination and, and access to, to services. And, and that's where the digital nation um, comes in. So that we, you know, we're digitizing all our government services, our processes, procedures, uh, including digitizing our cultural knowledge, um, so that it's it's also um, digitized. Um, so that's that's the approach that we we are taking, and obviously there's this technology available at the, at this time to be able to to reconstruct. Um, I guess any any experience that you would have in, in physical in the physical land like like Tuvalu, any experience you have with what you see with what you hear, uh, all that can be reconstructed into the to the to the cyberspace. And so we, we're exploring technology uh, to to be able to do that, so that um, you know we can continue to to operate effectively from from anywhere in the world, so long as you're connected to the to the internet. That's that's fascinating. Thank you. Fascinating ideas. Um, yeah, talking about uh, the maritime issue, uh, maritime boundary, boundaries, exclusive e economic zones. So um, what are your proposals in this regard? Because you mentioned UNCLOS uh, from 1982, climate change did not, um, did not play a role back then. Do you want to change uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea? Or do you again think more of an incremental approach to change the customary inter international law on, on this one? Mm. And what changes have to be done? Because the, the problem as I see it, there will be sea level rise and this would change the, change the boundaries when you stick to the law as an international law of the seas as it uh, stands today. And this is not nothing that that you and other small island countries can be uh, satisfied with. Yeah, we, um, you, you might be aware of the, um, the declaration by the leaders, Pacific Island uh, Forum leaders uh, last year, uh, a declaration precisely on this point that I'm saying about the um, 
uh, our baselines and the permanency of our maritime claims. Uh, obviously, the, the approach has been a conservative one where we the Pacific is interpreting or reinterpreting UNCLOS uh, in favor of the proposition of, uh, of permanent baselines. Uh, so that once you've you've uh, declared those coordinates that, that, that form up your, your baseline, um, that, that those are, are permanent. Um, and so that's the, the approach that the, the forum has taken uh, collectively to, to interpret. I think that there is an approach of reinterpreting some of these provisions in, in favor of um, the proposition of, of a permanency of our baselines. Yeah, so, so you mentioned this declaration on preserving maritime zones in the face of climate change related sea level rise of last year, August or so. What has the response of the international community beyond the Pacific Island Forum countries been to this one so far? Are there positive responses or do they just ignore this position or what's going on at this front? The, the the international law commission uh is is still working on on this and they're collecting uh state practice to be able to um to formulate a position on 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 this declaration um i'm not too sure whether you've come across the the report by the house of lords on unclos i think it was released recently about a, a month ago uh and in that report the the house of lords um acknowledged the declaration by the Pacific Island leaders on, on uh, maritime uh, boundaries. Uh, and in fact, they, they endorsed it and encouraged the UK government to, to adopt um, you know, the, the same principles that the Pacific has, has taken. So we, I, I take that as a, as a positive uh, reflection from the UK on, on, on this. And we're hoping that um, more countries will be able to, to support this uh, position the Pacific has taken. Mm. Okay, and you also said somewhere, I'm not sure now where, that you also want to change the constitution of Tuvalu to enshrine all these new principles in the constitution. What's the, what's the state on, on that one? Right, so um, the, I, I'm actually the, serving as the, the chair of the select parliamentary select committee looking at the constitutional review uh, process. And, and one of the recommendations that uh, has been approved by the, the committee is, is to reflect these principles in the constitution. Uh, we feel that it's important that in the, you know, the, the, the highest law of the land that we recognize these, these principles. I think it's a, it's a strong statement to, to make to the international community uh, that these are things that we are advocating on the international plane, but in our laws as well, these are, these are being reflected as, as, as our state practice on, on, on this particular issue. And so what ha has to happen so that it becomes part of the constitution? The so it's, it's, um, it's going to be tabled at the next uh, parliament session in June or July for, for first reading. Um, and then it goes out for consultations to, to, the, to the people. And then uh, the next, the following session will be for the second and, and final reading. And approval, um, and so any amendments to the constitution requires a two-thirds, two-thirds support of uh, the total membership of parliament. Mm. And what are the prospects? Can you say already something on that? Oh, I'm I'm, I'm confident that um, you know because the the committee has approved it, and the committee is made up of um, government representatives and those as well in the opposition, and so we've reached a consensus on on this particular issue of the um, statehood and, and maritime zone. So I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident that this is going to go through. Mm, okay. And so uh, your position is Tuvalu, even if it does not exist physically anymore as a land island or so, should maintain its EEZ. So, and how would this be managed then? So they, because EEZs uh, as it stands today are dependent on some kind of physical land, uh, the EZ is a mm -hmm. surrounding or so. So how, how would this work then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's the, 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 the position that we, we're taking. Obviously, um, the coordinates that we've declared, um, we, we, our view is that these, these become permanent. So the, the recognition of these, if, if they become adopted as international norms that we'd expect that countries would recognize uh, our claims to to those to those areas but i understand that uh, 
you know, the, the proposition under the UNCLOS is that uh, maritime zones are drawn from uh, physical land territory that is able to sustain life. Uh, but again, you know, we, we, we have to do what we can uh, and we will see the more countries come on board and hopefully we'll be able to change some of these bigger uh, conventions and treaties. Okay, then I come back. I, I, I don't know, uh, maybe you have uh, answered it already, but uh, just to, to get clarity for myself. So what would be your preferred way to go? incremental changes of international customary law in this regard or a change of UNCLOS or is this not uh, contradictory? I, I, what we're doing at the moment is incremental um, you know we're contributing to that by signing up countries on a bilateral uh, level and so we feel that um, the more countries were able to get on board then that would make it easier down the track to be able to change some of these um, uh, treaties and, 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 you know, for example, UNCLOS. Um, but I, I want to draw an example from, from the US in 1945. Uh, President Truman made a declaration as well on uh, the US's claim to its continental shelf. Uh, at the time, no country in the world had, had uh, you know, recognized a claim to the continental shelf. So the US was making an, uh, a unilateral <laughs> proclamation to the world that they they claim the continental shelf and that was the beginning more countries started following that that trend and became part of customer international law it's part of of UNCLOS and it's recognized uh, you know under international uh, law so you got to start somewhere and I think it might look like we're breaking rank on, on some of these issues but I think the more countries that follow suit then that becomes the the, the norm and the standard yeah, thank you. Uh, that's that will be very interesting to to see how things will develop over the next next years in this sphere. And another issue of international law, of course, is also the international legal regime to give protection to people displaced by climate change, because there's nothing uh, uh, there in this regard uh, at the moment. So, do you think that there is need? to have to create an to create an international legal regime to give such protection yeah and the, the position that we've taken is is that we we, we support um uh you know the formation or the establishment of, of a framework or um legal avenues to be able to protect um people that are displaced for because of of, of climate change so that's something we, we certainly would, would support uh, but like I said, we've been very sensitive in how we, we approach this, very careful in how we approach this, this issue of uh, relocation so that uh, uh, our message is clear that, um, you know, it's, it's not the primary uh, solution to the problem, but nevertheless, we, we need to have things in place to, to, to protect um, people that are affected. You already have relatively big Tuvalu and other Pacific Island country diaspora communities in countries like Australia, the United States, New Zealand, and so forth. Is there anything you can learn from the diaspora experience and the exchange between people in Tuvalu and the people in New Zealand in, in the diaspora? Are there channels of com regular communication? And can you imagine to establish a home away from home in the way uh, the Tuvalu di diaspora has than it in in let's say New Zealand or so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess for I mean, if you're a Tuvaluan living anywhere in part of the world, you 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 still identify yourself as as a as a Tuvaluan, and you you still hold dear the the values and the culture of Tuvalu. So regardless of wherever you are in the world, that these things define you as a as, as a person. Um, I guess what we, I guess what we hear from our diaspora is the, is is obviously is the, uh, the 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 next generation uh, that are growing up in, you know, that are born and bred outside of Tuvalu. Uh, they feel that uh, I guess there's a, a loss of some of these 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 values, a loss of 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 some of this culture. Um, so as a government, we feel that it's important that we, uh, you know, make these connections and ensure that we're strengthening. Um, 
uh, you know, the, 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 the culture with, with, with our people, wherever they are in the world. And, and this is where it comes back again to the digital nation uh, concept, because you're able to reconstruct uh, everything that you would experience in Tuvalu in the cyberspace and to give access to, to our people wherever they are in the world. Uh, to be able to have that access, whether it, whether it be to for the for the knowledge, um, uh, everything, everything that you're able to hear and see in Tuvalu, we hopefully we're able to replicate that and allow the, the next generations to stay in touch with with our culture and our values. Another issue is the link between climate change and security. I'm surprised to see that in the Tuvalu government's foreign policy, you have as priority area five climate change and other security issues which means that you very much think of climate change as a security issue, which of course is very interesting for an institution like ours. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what kind of concept of security you have when you talk of climate change as a security issue? Yeah, well, well we feel that climate change is an existential threat uh, to Tuvalu. Um, as, as I said, the, 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 the scenario at, at the moment is that we could be, we be forced to, to leave our islands, or we could uh, lose our islands. So we, we see that very much as a, as a, as a security issue. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand the, uh, the context in Tuvalu. We, we, we are the fourth smallest country in the world, uh, flat atoll islands, um, the smallest population. Uh, and so these, these events, you know, not just sea level rise, but even cyclones and, and the, um, the, the water seeping into our waterlands, uh, these are these are real issues that are, are concerning our our people. You're a very small country, but punching well above your weight when it comes to the international climate change discourse. As mentioned at the beginning, your world famous appearance, not in Glasgow but knee deep in water in Tuvalu, addressing the people in Glasgow, really captured the attention of the whole world. So, what's your assessment of the outcome of Glasgow, and what would your expectations be for the next round of COP and Tuvalu's role in it? Yeah, I, I think the, you know, the, the, what we're looking at in Tuvalu and in the Pacific is, is to really get countries to take strong climate action uh, to be able to reduce their, their greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Uh, because at the moment, even with the pledges that have been made, um, you know, we, we're set to look, we're looking at a, a 2.5, 2.6 increase. Um, and, and that really means we, we may not be around in the in the next hundred years, uh, and so it's it's a real serious issue. Um, uh, there's there's a lot at stake for for, for Tuvalu and countries that are um, vulnerable to to climate change, and so it is quite disappointing um, coming out of COP that we we haven't been able to to reach uh, those targets that we've we've set for ourselves. Um, you know, we advocated strongly for a financial mechanism to be able to um, support uh, loss and damage. Um, I mean, these issues keep coming up and we feel that, um, you know, it, it's, it's becoming more difficult. Countries are just not listening or, or not implementing uh, pledges that, that they have made. Um, so it's, it's disappointing uh, from that end. But I, I think that there are a few positives that we, we, can, we, we can draw from, from COP. Uh, but we feel that um, we, we need to be more strategic uh, in our approach to do what we can do, uh, that it is within our power to do. And we need to work closely with um, like-minded uh, countries um, to, to have a stronger voice on the international, uh, international plane. And that's another question, how you organize this collaboration with like-minded countries. You mentioned the Pacific Island Forum and the International Law Commission and other international organizations. How can a small country like Tuvalu cover all these different areas and institutions? For example, you mentioned last year's August Declaration on Maritime Boundaries. Was Tuvalu involved in elaborating this declaration? And is Tuvalu involved in the discussions of the working group of the International Law Commission? All these things are massive tasks for a small country like yours, and you have nothing but our admiration in tackling them. Yeah, in, in fact, Tuvalu was the chair of the, um, the Pacific Island Forum uh, when that declaration was um, negotiated and, and um, put forward to, to our leaders. So we, we had a, uh, a part and an important role in, in that process. Uh, but, but you're right, it, it's, it's difficult for, for small countries to be able to, to, to manage uh, all these issues uh, on, the, on the international plane, uh, given as well that we have a, a small administration. And it's something we, we, we face every time we go to, um, 
you know, to, to, to conferences and to, to meetings for negotiations that we, we have a very limited number of, of people attending when compared to big delegations that are coming from the, the, the bigger countries. Um, so, I mean, but that's why I feel it's important that we work with like-minded countries, that we don't have to carry the load individually, that we can share this uh, across the, our membership in, in the Pacific, for example. And we've done that, and then we've identified champions in, in the Pacific to, to be able to focus on specific uh, climate issues uh, areas. Um, so I think that's, that's something that we, we are doing at the moment. Um, but I think we also need to look at ourselves as, as, as equal players on, on, the, on the international plane, because we, we all have an equal vote when it comes to, to, to many of these issues that are being decided on the, on the international plane. So I think it's, it's important that we work with like-minded uh, people so that we become more influential uh, on, on, on these outcomes. And we're also encouraging that, um, you know, countries that are, are most affected by climate change, that we need to start putting candidates forward to, to in, intergovernment organizations, to committees in the UN, uh, because I feel that's, that's one way that we become more influential on, on that level uh, in, to influence outcomes on the international plane. You um, earlier men mentioned earlier that Fiji also already has offered land for Tuvaluans just in case. And as far as I remember, the Kiribati government has bought land in Fiji on Vanua Levu. And uh, initially there was this idea this might be used for relocation of Ikiribas to Fiji. But now I, uh, I understand the current government says it's more for uh, maintaining food security. So uh, why did Tuvalu uh, did not take up this, this Fijian offer? Because in a way, uh, you could say this is very generous by F Fiji, but on the other hand, you could also say this would make you dependent on another Pacific Island country. So what is your thinking about uh, Kiribati's uh, way to go and buy land in Fiji and why uh, does Tuvalu not pursue this, this course? Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, Kiribati has in fact gone ahead and purchased land uh, in Fiji. Um, Obviously, the offer uh, was made by the, the Fiji Prime Minister um, during the, the previous uh, government, uh, but we, we, we've taken the view that, um, you know, that there are other priorities that we, we need to look at, but it doesn't mean that we're not looking at um, um, purchasing properties in Fiji. In fact, we, that's something that is, that is in the pipeline uh, at, the, at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Another topic, uh, in December 2021, so only a few months ago, your government announced that it was wants to explore deep seabed mining. And uh, the International Seabed Authority declared that Circular Metals Tuvalu, a mining company sponsored by the Tuvaluan government, has applied for an exploration permit. And this came as a major surprise to, to many and you might be aware that the former prime minister of Tuvalu, Inele Sapuanga, was very uh, critical about that. So how do you reconcile this deep sea uh, mining approach with your climate policies? Because as I understand it, deep sea mining has all these unknowns with regard to the environmental effects. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, thank you for that, that question. And I just want to make it clear that we've actually withdrawn officially withdrawn our bid uh, to, to uh, our sponsorship of, of, of that company, uh -huh. um, given obviously our concerns um, regarding the, the, the environmental issues that, that are surrounding that. So I, did, I wanted to make it clear uh, at the outset that uh, we have officially withdrawn. Uh, but the, the, we do have a law that is in place, which was actually passed during NLS Obama's time in 2014, the, the, the Tuvalu, Minerals um, Act, which which enables, which actually provides the enablement for uh, Tuvalu to do to provide sponsorship, uh, and so that's something we will need to uh, to look into as well. But we feel that um, uh, seabed mining is something that that is is going to happen in the future um, uh, in the in the obviously in the area that is under the um, the control of the International Seabed Authority, and we feel quite strongly that. Um, 
you know that those explorations need need to look at the the environmental issues and the impacts of of that. At the moment, there, there is really nothing uh, concrete or in depth reports that gives us the insights into that. And so, nothing will happen on, at this front in the immediate future in Tuvalu. So, you are not pursuing this no. for that at the moment. That's, uh, that's okay. right. Mm, that's that was not uh, clear to to me um so coming back to the security dimension so you know the bowie declaration uh, talks about climate change as the greatest threat to to the security health and well-being of the pacific island countries do you think that the bowie declaration is still up to date or whether you have to in a way, revise it to strengthen this climate change dimension of the Bowie Declaration. Are there any discussions about uh, the future in, of, of, of the Bowie Declaration or a follow-up declaration? Um, yeah, well, the, the Bowie Declaration was, in fact, um, there, was, there was an amendment to it some years back to expand on the, the definition of, of security to, to encompass uh, climate change as, as a security issue. Uh, but obviously, we're, we're, we're all in support of um, of issues of surrounding climate change and ensuring that uh, we, we have the, the legal framework in, in place to be able to, um, um, to to protect our, our people in the in the Pacific. Uh, what would your priorities be for the next uh, COP? Uh, is it will it be loss and damage, or which issues will you try to uh, to to make make uh, the, the focus of your and your Pacific Island country friends approach? And will you give another talk from need, <laughs> need deep in water or will you go? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we need to, to, to relook at how we are um, putting our message out to, to the public um, because we feel that um, it's important that we take a holistic approach when it comes to advocacy, that we're not just focusing on, on the leaders that make the decision, because we know that they've, they've failed many times in the, in the past, but we need, we need to reach out to the public um, because it is the people that put their leaders in place. And I think that the more people become aware of the, um, the climate crisis, um, the more pressure that they're putting on their leaders and, and ensuring that, that their leaders are coming up with strong climate action and policies that, that address uh, these issues. Uh, obviously, the, the IPCC uh, report that has come out is just reemphasizes again the, you know, the dire situation that we're in at the moment. And so we, we want to, to, you know, to run with that message and, and saying that this is a really a critical time for us and countries really need to take action now. If not now, we will miss this, this window of opportunity to, uh, to save ourselves. On behalf of the Todor Peace Institute, Simon, I want to offer you, offer you our deepest thanks. Uh, it's always great to see politicians who are frank and intelligent as you are in terms of grasping all the key issues and being open and, and honest about all the questions that we pose for you. In particular, I think I really want to thank you for reminding us of the value of neighborhoods and the centrality of whole communities doing what's necessary to mitigate uh, the negative impacts of climate change and the that's not possible to do what's necessary to adapt to climate change challenges. Uh, secondly, I think, as you've told us, it's really important that uh, we're reminded of, as wealthy nations of the necessity to begin thinking about loss and damage reparations for countries such as you who are going to suffer the most extreme consequences of our actions. Um, I think that's something that we need to focus more global attention on how we make sure that when countries such as yours are confronting these deep challenges, uh, when you experience deep loss, uh, there is compensation for that loss. Your idea too of uh, Tuvalu becoming a digital nation, a virtual na nation, and all that means in terms of new conceptions of sovereignty is one that's both very challenging, but one that all of us, I think, have got to take on board uh, as we begin to think about continuity for countries such as yours. Um, it's really important that um, countries such, such as New Zealand, for example, um, respond to your, your bilateral initiatives to recognize um, the possibility that you may become and may need to become a, a digital nation. 
Uh, and thanks also for your clarity around what it means uh, uh, to maintain and preserve your exclusive economic zone um, in the terrible event of you being inundated. Um, that's something else, again, which countries in the regions are all going to have to uh, rally around and uh, enable you to observe that zone for whatever lies beneath the water. But most of all, I really want to thank you for the time you've given us, uh, for being such an outstanding new generation Pacific leader, immersed in the past, but positively focused on a just and peaceful future. Um, it seems to me that Tuvalu's in very good hands in, um, in your leadership. Um, and whether uh, the future is a virtual one or a, or a real one, uh, I'm sure that uh, you're going to have the best interests of the Tuvalu people at, at heart. You exude uh, a lot of confidence and optimism in the future, uh, and that confidence and optimism will, I'm sure, uh, be crucial to making sure that you help your people uh, negotiate a future for themselves uh, in this part of the world. So once again, thank you very much for that most precious time you shared with us and thank you for all your insights.